The satrapy of Armenia, a region controlled by the Orotid dynasty was one of the satrapies of the Achaemenid Empire in the 6th century BC, which later became an independent kingdom. Its capitals were Tushpur and later Erebani. History Origins After the collapse of the Kingdom of Urartu, the land came to be under the administration of the Median Empire and the Scythians. Later the territory was conquered by the Achaemenid Empire, which incorporated it as a satrapy, and thus named it the Land of Armena. Orotid Dynasty The Orotid Dynasty, or known by their native name of Javanduni, was a hereditary Armenian dynasty and the rulers of the successor state to the Iron Age Kingdom of Ararat. Of probable Iranian origin, members of the dynasty ruled Armenia intermittently during the period spanning the 6th to at least the 2nd century BC, first as client kings or satraps of the Median and Achaemenid empires, and later after the collapse of the Achaemenid empire as rulers of an independent kingdom, and later as kings of Sophene and Commagene, who eventually succumbed to the Roman Empire. The Orotids established their supremacy over Armenia around the time of the Scythian and Median invasion in the 6th century BC. Its founder was Orents I. Sakavakiats. His son Tigranes Orotid united his forces with Cyrus the Great and killed Media's king. Moses of Korin calls him the wisest, most powerful and bravest of Armenian kings. From 553 BC to 521 BC, Armenia was a subject of the Achaemenid Empire, but during Darius I's reign, he decided to conquer Armenia. He sent an Armenian named Dardasi to suffocate the revolt, later substituting him for the Persian Vomiza who defeated the Armenians on May 20, 521 BC. Around the same time, another Armenian by the name of Araka, son of Haldita, claimed to be the son of the last king of Babylon, Nabonidus and renamed himself Nebuchadnezzar IV. His rebellion was short-lived and was suppressed by Antaphrenes, Darius a bow carrier. After five raids Armenia resisted. Greek commander and historian Xenophon provided important information on Orotid Armenia. After the Battle of Gogamla, Orans III restored independence in Armenia. But in 2001 BC, Armenia was conquered by Artashas, an Armenian commander of the Seleucid Empire, who was also a descendant of the Orotid dynasty. The last Orotid king Orants IV was killed, but the Orotids continued to rule in Sophene and Commagene until the 1st century BC. In two inscriptions of King Antiochus I of Commagene on his monument at Nemrit and Orants, called Aroandes, is reckoned, among others as an ancestor of the Orotids ruling over Commagene, who traced back their family to Darius the Great. Armenia as Xenophon saw it. Greek mercenary soldiers, 10,000 in number, who had been aiding the younger Cyrus of Persia against his brother Artaxerxes, returned home in 401 BC, after the defeat and death of Cyrus at Cunaxa. On their way back, they passed through Armenia, and the Anabasis, written by Xenophon, their leader, contains some valuable information about that country. Their precise itinerary has not been definitely traced, but according to the generally accepted theory, they crossed the Centrites River. The modern Botansu, north of Tyl, reached the Teleboas River, the modern Karasu, in the plain of Mush, and then the Euphrates near Manuscut, fording it where it was only knee-deep. Thence they marched to Ulti, the country of the Tauchi, south of Kars. From the great rich and populous city of Cumnias in the Scythian country, they proceeded through the area of Zarishat and south of Ardahan, and finally through the mountains of the Macronian Colchi tribes to the Black Sea port of Trebizond. Armenia is described by Xenophon as a vast and rich country, with Orond as ruling as satrap and Tiribaz as Uparchos or vice governor. In Xenophon's time the Armins had not yet occupied the plain of Ararat, which was then inhabited by Saspirs, Alarodians in the oldest native tribes. The Kartuchi, living in the south of the centuries, were a warlike people, not subjects of the Persians. 
Bay and the Armins were in almost continuous conflict, which, says Xenophon, explains why there were no villages in existence on the right bank of the Centrides, in the vicinity of modern Serd, Arman kinship with Calduratians. The Kartusi were a sedentary people, with a comparatively high degree of civilization. Their dwellings were described by the Greek soldiers as elegant and furnished with many copper utensils. They had plenty of provisions and wine kept in cemented cisterns. According to Strabo, they were skilled architects, experts in the tactics of besieging fortresses. Their arms consisted of bows and slings. The bows were one and a half yards long, and the arrows more than a yard. This mode of life does not harmonize with cattle-growing nomadic people, such as the Kurds. The Armins, therefore, thinks Marquat must have been kindred of the Kalduratians. The army of Orondas, says Xenophon, besides Armins, included Mards and Chaldean mercenaries. The latter were a doughty people, noted for their long shields and spears. The Chaldean soldiers of Orondas are considered to have been the inhabitants of Sassan and the Koit Mountains, who maintained their independence until their assimilation with the Armins. As to the mercenary Mods, they were, according to Herodotus, an Iranian nomadic tribe, to be identified, in Marquardt's opinion, with the modern Kurds. The 10th century Arabian historian Masoudi states that the Kurds acknowledged as their ancestor the chieftain Kurd, the son of Mod. In Armenian history the Kurds have been known as the Mar people, the district of Mardistan, in historic Armenia, corresponds to Artaz. West of the modern Maku, South Iran, the district of Mardali must have been located to the south of Erzurum, north of the Bengal sources. The Mards of this section of the country were evidently immigrants from the south, says Adents. The bulk of the tribe occupied one of the southern areas of Aspurakan, near the upper course of the Centrides River. Xenophon mentioned particularly the extremely fierce and hardy Chalibi tribe, called Choldiwa by Strabo, living in the Pontic Mountains, and mostly engaged in iron mining and forging. Several authors classify this people as being of the same stock as the Calduratians. The Tauchi and the Phasian tribes, neighbors of the Chalibs, who likewise offered stiff resistance to the Greeks, are represented in the Taiq and Pagan districts of Armenia. The above-mentioned tribes and several others, including the Chimera and Scythian settlers from southern Russia, dating from the 8th century BC, were all independent of Persia. Scythian tribes, the Saspirs of Herodotus, had occupied considerable areas extending from Colchis to Media, around Madanak Javan and as far as Kars, Lenanakan and the plain of Ararat. Alongside the Chimerans and Scythians should be listed the Sarmatian tribe, which includes the Saraks and the Gogs, after whom the Armenian provinces of Sherek and Gugark seem to have been named. The Mesoshmushkans, the Irushans and the Pakshans were also among the inhabitants of the Armenian plateau, each having its own language or dialect, and particular kind of social life and culture. They were all eventually assimilated with the Armans, adding their numbers to the larger elements from the Chaldee and the Hittites. Arman Economics and Commerce Despite the agreement entered into between Tiribaz and the Greek chieftains, some of their soldiers, insolently, burned some of the villages where they were to stop. They even had the audacity to capture the tent of Tiribaz, who, relying on the treaty, seems to have been unprepared, and carried away his silver-footed bedstead and his cups, as well as his bakers and cup-bearers. Finding the villages evacuated, the Greeks spent seven days in sumptuous eating and drinking. The tables everywhere were loaded with the meats of lamb, goat, pig, veal and chicken, as well as bread of barley and wheat. They drank beer from a great jar, sucking it through a tube. The horses of Armenia, says Xenophon, were smaller than those of Persia, but livelier. Being told that horses were sacrificed to the sun, Xenophon gave his old horse, in exchange for a foal, to a village chief, to be sacrificed. After being fattened, land of plenty, 
Besides plenty of wheat, barley and cereals, the almond villages had in store raisins, perfumed wine, sesame, fragrant oil of almonds and turpentine. The people were both cattle breeders and agriculturists. They exported many horses. Herodotus calls the almonds polyprobatoire, rich in animals. Distinction should be made, however, between the civilization in the different parts of the country. Stately houses with towers on the banks of the Centrides River were in striking contrast to the underground dwellings near the sources of the Euphrates. The rural life of the Armins was indicative of a patriarchal or family character. A group of villages was surrounded with barricades and was governed by a village chief or Kamarch representing the satrap. Payment of taxes to the Persian king was made collectively. The absence of cities was noticeable. Various clans, settled in villages under local chiefs, supplied a specified number of soldiers to the army of the nearest petty king. A general of Darius was one of these kings. By the large numbers of the Armenian army serving under the great Persian monarch, recruited from one section of the Armenian plateau, we are led to believe that all of the comparatively small number of new settlers were soldiers. The same was true in the Georgian and Albanian lands of the Caucasus, as pointed out by the Georgian historian Chavakishvili. The word Eri in the ancient Iberian language meant both people and soldiers. The Medes, after subduing the kingdom of Urartu, utilized the Armins in keeping that turbulent people under subjection. Marquardt notes that the settling of the warlike Arman colonists in the strategic places in the Armenian highlands was because of their military capacity. From all this, Manandian reaches the conclusion that, as the ancient Slavons, so the ancient Armans were in the period of warring democracy, the same may be said of the Medes and the Persians of old, whose democratic organization and public assemblies point to their having a soldier population. Hence the destruction in the ancient East, even as in the medieval West of the cultural great powers, had been mainly achieved by the so-called barbarian new peoples, such as the Medes, Persians and Armans. Applying the principle to the Armands, Professor Ma has remarked, and now there succeeded, one after the other, warlike Aryan peoples, just as in later times came in rushing masses of Turks. These Aryan races who, at that time, were certainly savages by comparison with the natives, were nevertheless strong in their military organization, and subdued the culturally higher races intermixed with them and created a new world, attention is called by Manandian to the fact that the commercial intercourse between Babylon and Armenia was carried on for the most part by the Assyrians. Business transactions, limited in Armenia in those days, were principally in the hands of the Semitic peoples, while the Armenians were essentially farmers and cattle breeders.